Welcome to Our Path Forward, a conversation on the COVID-19 vaccine and campus repopulation efforts for the Rutgers community. I'm Sherri Ann Butterfield, Executive Vice Chancellor at Rutgers University of Newark and Chair of the University-wide COVID-19 Advisory Committee. Before we begin, it is important to note that this production is observing all CDC, state, and local safety guidelines. Today, I am joined by good friends and colleagues, Vice President for Health Affairs, Vicente Gracias, and Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer, Tony Calcado. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining me today, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to jump right in. And my first question is really around the vaccine. And so, Dr. Gracias, you become the, the point of contact. What type of vaccines will be made available? And what will be the protocol for its rollout? Ms. Sherry, I think that's a wonderful place to start. Uh, we currently have in the United States and globally two vaccines um, here that are probably prominent in everyone's minds. Those are the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. Um, those are what's rolling out across the country. Um, globally, there are other vaccines that are being made available depending on who's been manufacturing them. But here in the United States, we should concentrate, especially at Rutgers, around Moderna and Pfizer. As time goes on, we'll hear names like Johnson & Johnson and several other ones. As far as Pfizer and Moderna are concerned, those two vaccines are messenger RNA-based vaccines, which means they actually create an immune response within our cells that create a very good protection against the uh, COVID-19 virus. Those two vaccines, however, are also new. They have been produced through a new process that has been incredibly well studied, but certainly are still new in terms of the applications that we're using now to fight the pandemic. Um, what the state has done in order to try to make sure that everyone that needs to be vaccinated is vaccinated in an orderly fashion, um, we've uh, created three different tiers that um, allow us to work through essential and non-essential healthcare workers all the way to the general public. What people are hearing now is the term 1A, 1B, and 1C. Right. Those uh, tiering are really associated with how well we can maintain our workforce who are taking care of all the COVID-19 patients. Mm -hmm. You can imagine that it's very difficult to vaccinate everybody at one time. So we had to start with 1A. And those are all, for Rutgers, all paid and unpaid healthcare workers on the front line that we need to maintain that care for our, all the patients that are sick. Um, we heard yesterday from the state um, that 1B is also going to include police officers, um, EMTs, and other frontline personnel that really keep a lot of us safe as we continue to vaccinate. So I think over the next several weeks to months that one will continue to be much more clarified, we'll continue to vaccinate those people, and we'll move as quickly as we can to Tier 2 and Tier 3 because our goal is to try to vaccinate everybody as quickly as possible. Thank you. I want to go back to the vaccine a little bit. Is it safe? Um, I think that's probably the forefront of everyone's mind is, mm -hmm. are these vaccines safe? The, the simple answer is yes. Um, there's an enormous amount of work that's been done. Um, I know that uh, most of us struggle with the amount of press in terms of, has this thing been accelerated too quickly? Did we speed up too much? Was Operation Warp right. Speed? A political tool or was it really mm -hmm. science? And I can tell you with, uh, with a surety, having not just my own opinion, but the opinion of the scientific community, uh, the National Academy of Medicine, that these vaccines are safe. Um, they've been evaluated by the FDA, they've been evaluated in several countries, and they continue to be evaluated. And I think that's the most important part. The, the acceleration or warp speed did two things. It allowed us to move into phase three trials earlier. We do phase one, phase two, and phase three as we expose more and more humans from animals to humans. Um, and, and we were allowed to go from phase two to phase three within six months as opposed to two years that takes longer. The other part that's really advanced the speed of getting the vaccine out is the manufacturing part. Because the federal and government invested in these companies, they were manufacturing the vaccines while we were testing them. So even though we have two vaccines now, Pfizer and Moderna, that have made all of the safety standards that have been in place for years, they have been brought to market or to our use much more quickly because the manufacturing was also sped up. So it, we do know through all of the scientific evidence that these vaccines are safe and they're very effective. What we don't know is what is the long-term effect. 
two years, three years, 10 years from now. We don't know. We continue to follow everyone, mm -hmm. um, or the companies do and the clinical trials do, of the individuals that have been vaccinated up till now, and we'll continue to do that in the United States as people vaccinate. We'll also be following them. But there's a lot of things we don't know long term. You know, whenever an iPhone changes and you put it in your ear, we do not know the long term effects. Or if a new Coca Cola or a caffeine drink comes on market, we don't know the long term effects, but we go ahead and use them. So we think they're about as safe as humanly possible, but it, there is um, a, a, a gap in our knowledge in terms of what happens five to 10 years from now. We think it's very remote. What I will say to end the comment is that getting vaccinated is much safer than getting COVID-19. Thank you so much for that, because as we know, there are so many people who are, have lots of questions about yeah. the safety and whether should they or shouldn't they. So that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, and along the sort of trying to reassure people, but can you talk a little bit about possible side effects and allergies as a result of the vaccine? So um, that's actually one of the things that's been very well studied. So there have been some allergic reactions to the vaccine. It's generally associated with people that have had allergic reactions to vaccines in the past or have had a what we call an anaphylactic reaction to some form of allergen. So they are, they're already hyperactive in terms of their immune response. Um, it's very, very few people. Um, in the one million or more doses that have already been delivered in the United States, there have been maybe uh, 10 to 20 allergic reactions in that entire group. So it's a very tiny amount of people that have that allergic reaction. But we are monitoring for it. We are so concerned about safety that everyone that's being vaccinated, even though we may only be picking out you know, 20 or 30 people out of a million vaccines, mm -hmm. everyone that's being vaccinated now is being monitored for that allergic reaction. What we do know is that it, it generally occurs the majority of the time within 15 minutes of being vaccinated. Those are the people we really worry about. Mm -hmm. So even though it's a tiny number, everyone that gets vaccinated is going to be watched for that allergic reaction. And certainly we're able to treat those people if they're under an observation when that happens. So I want to move to think about the vaccines in relation also to the individuals um, at Rutgers University and the Rutgers community. Sure. Will, will they be required to receive the vaccine? Is it optional? Will it be optional? Um, well, it is America, and Rutgers is part of America. So the vaccine at this point is not mandatory across the United States or here in New Jersey. And certainly Rutgers, um, with our mm -hmm. stance of human liberties and our history of protecting that, um, the vaccine is not mandatory. It is something that we think because we are a university, we can educate our community, we can educate ourselves. And I think we can show everyone that it's essential that our Rutgers community vaccinate itself. We have been working very hard as a community to withstand this pandemic. And you've heard for over a year, and certainly you have been involved in leading this with us, mm -hmm. um, that we've been incredibly successful in protecting ourselves even compared to the state or the nation. And I think it's because we trust each other and we're able to educate each other. So as we think about the vaccination process and the vaccine, um, will the vaccine logistics be consistent across all the Rutgers campuses? I know that's a question in the forefront of everybody's mind, actually. Yes, and I think that's probably the most um, um, unique part about Rutgers. We have had from the beginning to take care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. We had to make our own PPE because it didn't show right. up. We had to do our own testing because we needed to test our own individuals. Yes. We had to do our, some of our own contact tracing with the local departments of health to make sure that our community mm -hmm. was a priority for everyone. Um, and now we have to vaccinate ourselves as well. So there are logistics and sites and vaccine supplies that we have to go through in order to do that. Um, but the teams that we lead are already mobilizing in Newark, in New Brunswick, with Piscataway and in Camden uh, to begin to move the vaccination process forward on our own here at Rutgers University. That's really important because that's been a question that I know all of us have been hit with from, from our constituents. So if you think, if you given everything that you've said and what you've been hearing from the community, what do you think are the most important thing that people should know? I think the most important thing about vaccines and vaccinations that we need to know is that they are safe. Um, at this point, every human process and uh, has been done to try to make sure that these vaccines are safe. 
Um, even though the politics aside from last year and even what's happening this year, if we really look at the scientific evidence that, that has made this university and this university community safe all along, we have always been ahead of that curve and ahead of that knowledge because the Rutgers science also has helped us stay ahead of that curve. So if there's one message we need to give to everybody in the community is that we do trust the science that we develop here at Rutgers. We trust the scientific community that we um, work with. And as far as we know, this vaccine is safe. And the majority of us that work in the healthcare system um, who understand that science have already been vaccinated, are waiting to get vaccinated. And our role is really to help educate the rest of our community to do that. These vaccines are about as safe as we can possibly make them in mm -hmm. order to fight this pandemic. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Vince. I appreciate it. I'm going to turn to you, Tony, to talk about repopulation. How will the vaccine affect campus operations during the upcoming spring and fall semesters? Thank you, Sherry Ann. And, and I think it's, it may be worth just a, a little bit of a brief history as Please. we work our way towards what's coming up. Um, it, just before we came on camera, I uh, was having a conversation with some individuals out in the lobby, and we were talking about it. this marks a year a year since we've actually begun to respond to this, what was then um, a virus that was transmitting quickly um, and getting out of control in Wuhan, China. And we had individuals and students and our overseas programs and our study abroad programs. And we were already concerned exactly a year ago when we returned from break as to how we would respond and what would be necessary in trying to access information we did not have. And then things broke quickly as we all know. And um, we have spent uh, uh, the better part of a year mitigating what was happening. Um, we uh, depopulated our campuses almost entirely, moved on to remote almost entirely. And we've always watched out for the health and safety of our community right from the start. We made a decision early not to come back in, in the fall. We worked through that decision when we planned for the spring, for now, 21. And we knew um, that nothing had really changed. And if anything, right. things had just gotten worse. And we determined that if this is the case, how can we really look differently? And I will tell you from a, a personal perspective in the team that I work with, that it is a phenomenal team, um, we were, you know, there was some despair that things just were not mm -hmm. changing at all. And we knew that it, it was not sustainable. Um, and then less than a month ago, really the world changed. And so make no mistake, vaccination is the game changer. And in less than a month, we have shifted gears entirely and built out a plan uh, that will take us to the fall of 21. And, that, and that's really what we are planning for now. So our spring looks very much like our fall did, but our fall of 21 will look completely different. Mm -hmm. I will tell you that uh, in concert with uh, President Holloway, and his cabinet, which includes, of course, the chancellors at each, at each of the campuses and his senior leadership team, um, we have established the goal that we will be back in the fall of 21, 100%. Now, what that may mean is that we will not all be here at right. the same time, but everyone will be back touching the campus our students will all have face-to-face -face instruction in some format. We need to rebuild our community because that's what we do when it comes to educating our students, and we owe that to our students. Thank you for that, Tony, because that is definitely a question on lots of people's minds. And sort of a follow-up question, you said that we'll be 100%, but in some form or fashion. When, do we, when can we imagine that a full repopulation of campus could, could occur? So I, think, um, I think we need to look at it. So let me walk us through this year. And then I can get to, to uh, with a little more precision with respect to your question. So we're looking at, um, uh, Vicente spoke a little bit about the different phases, phase one, phase two, phase three, that are laid out. And we're working alongside those phases. So our first phase is one uh, is being rolled out by way of vaccination, is beginning to work with all 1,500 of our departments with repopulation plans. Simultaneously, we are working with the provosts and the chancellors um, on academic plans for the fall semester. And then lastly, we're looking at the summer. What are we doing this summer? 
How will we repopulate? What will we actually bring back? Will we look like we looked in previous summers, looking at, uh, looking at conferences, uh, mm -hmm. looking at orientations, um, looking at camps? So we need to take a good, hard look at that. Stepping back uh, to departments and how they need to build their plans out or how we will work with them to build those plans out, what we're looking at is making sure that the plans are uh, fair and equitable, that it's not just the same people coming back. Mm -hmm. We're looking at, of course, remote schedules. We're looking at staggered schedules. Um, we're looking to see how we can fit whatever guidelines are put out by CDC and the state so that we make sure we're not exceeding the population that we have. We're looking at April through June to begin to minimally start to implement those plans and bring people back. Two reasons for that. First, um, and I, I really do want to give a shout out to all the parents and guardians who have become teachers um, at home. Mm -hmm. They become doctors, they become nurses, and they become playmates throughout this, yet while they're still working remotely. And, and that is a testament to their spirit and to the work that they've done. In that time period, K-12s will start to wind down for the year. We're not looking to add more stress right. to individuals. And it'll also allow us to see what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. And we want to make sure that the steps we take um, are not hurting people, that, they're, that, that we're doing this in a methodical and fair fashion as we move forward. July and August, we are looking to bring people back on a full rotational schedule. Yeah. Telecommuting still will be a big part. There's no doubt about that. Again, we will not have our population in any way, shape, or form here 100%. So all 100,000 community right. members at Rutgers University will not be at Rutgers University at the same time. I want to make that perfectly clear. Um, and then we want to full bore open up for the fall semester again not every student will be here at the same time. It will be, there will be hybrid of how instruction will happen. That's all being worked on now. But that's, those are the steps that we're looking to take. Where I see us back to what we were in 2019, I don't think um, reasonably that this will happen before September of 22. And I truly believe we'll probably be looking at 23, where, you know, we would have those 30-person and 50-person lectures that'll be, you know, completely full. I think there are a few things that happen here from a psychological perspective. People need to be comfortable. We need to understand that even in September, distancing and mask wearing and washing our hands, still the greatest protections, even with vaccine, will still be happening. Um, I, I often say it was easy bringing the university to a standstill. It'll be difficult bringing it back up to where we need to be. That's a shared responsibility we all need to do together. Um, similar to the question that I asked Vincente about campus uh, protocols across all campuses, um, will they be consistent in terms of repopulation? They will. Um, we need to understand that uh, right from the beginning. So we have something called the Emergency Operations Center, a team of people that are representative across the university from all the chancellor units, from central administration, from every corner of the university. Our response since day one has been consistent across the university. There are always nuances. We know, for instance, that the mayor in the uh, great city of Newark uh, had an executive order that he put out just before the holiday, so that's a nuance that was further than what the governor had put out. We work um, with local governments in New Brunswick and in Camden, um, Piscataway, so, uh, but our overall response is consistent. We work together. Um, this is not a competition amongst us, and we work as one Rutgers when we look at our response across the university. So the protocols will all be the same. Thank you, thank you so much for that. Um, what do you think is the most important thing for the Rutgers, members of the Rutgers community to know about the population? We're coming back. We will come back. We have a responsibility to our students 
to give them the education and the experience that is Rutgers, irrespective of what campus they are on. Um, and so we will come back better than we left. I believe we will come back stronger. And um, I would just caution everyone and beg them to please, please, in this meantime, especially wear a face covering, watch your distance, wash your hands. But we will be back. Raptors, Raiders, Scarlet Knights, we will be back. Wonderful. Thank you. I love the need and love the support. As we bring our conversation to a close, it is important to remember that the situation is fluid and Rutgers is committed to keeping its community informed. Updates are readily available on the covid19.rutgers.edu website. I want to thank Tony and Vicente for their contributions to this conversation. Please know that health and safety will always be Rutgers' primary concern in delivering the best possible experience for its students, its faculty, and its staff, and the larger community. Thanks for watching, and stay safe.